I want to talk to you tonight about politics and the Christian. We're getting close to an election. I believe is the crisis of our national life. And as we approach this most important event, statistics tell us that 40 million Christians will not even vote at all. 40 million. And 15 million Christians in America are not even registered to vote. Gary DeMar inspired this message. He said many Christians are convinced that they have a biblical mandate not to be involved politically. They claim they should abstain, remain neutral, or not apply their Christian faith to political issues. And we need to remember that if we don't vote, other people are voting. And who they elect will have an impact on us. Now, it may surprise you to come to this church that there are so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ who feel this way. And it has frankly broken my heart. Just the past few days, I just looked across the internet and found the Christians who I believe are misleading other Christians. Here's a book by Jeremy Pryor. It's called Third Way Politics, A Call to Christians to Avoid exerting political power. Christians are misleading Christians writing newspaper articles like this one that that appeared in the Dallas Morning News in February. The title is, By Making So Much of Politics, Christians Are at Risk of Shifting Their Focus Away from God. Some Christians are carrying signs. I saw one that said, Only God can make America great again which of course is true. And another one said, real power is not found in a flag, party, or country. It comes from the cross, which is also true. My problem is these things sound super spiritual, but I'm going to leap into the breach and say that politics is not a dirty word. It's an inescapable part of life, And we're all going to have to deal with it. God himself is the author of all government. How many of you know that? Including political government. If you look up politics, it says it is the activities associated with the governance of a country or other area. Politics is the debate and conflict among individuals or parties having or hoping to achieve and use power in a country or a society. In other words, what happens politically is going to affect every citizen. Harold Laswell famously said a generation ago, politics is who gets what, when, and how. Now remember, it was our Christian forefathers who gave us the great American political system, I believe, under the direction of God. These were Christian men who engaged in politics. Thank God they didn't feel the way some of these do. And again, I'm compelled to quote the French aristocrat and historian who studied the greatness of America in her early years and actually made note of the knitting that Americans had between religion and politics. He said in France... I had seen the spirits of religion and freedom almost always marching in opposite directions. But in America, I found them intimately linked together and joined and reigned over the same land. Religion should therefore be considered as the first of their political institutions from the start. Politics and religion have agreed in America and have not ceased to do so. Even our presidents have recognized the close connection between religion and politics. President uh, Teddy Roosevelt is the one who coined the phrase uh, about the American presidency and called it a bully pulpit. But what has happened today? David Barton, in the role of pastors and Christians in civil government, said, America today has forgotten where we've come from And what we've been about, and this is especially true in the role of the church 
of ministers and Christians in the civil area. In his recent article on Christians' politics in the upcoming election, Gary DeMar said, I hear that tens of millions of Christians fail to vote in presidential elections. If this is true, it's a great evil with far-reaching implications. When you can stop a great tyranny and fail to do so, you're engaged in sinful behavior. Now, he's referring to James 4.17, written to Christians, that says, to him who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, to him it is sin. In other words, he's saying if a Christian knows they should vote and doesn't vote, that's a sin. But I have been thinking about that. I took some heat on that. I understand what's being said there. But I am honestly going to take a little different path tonight. I believe that many of our brothers and sisters who fail to vote are not so much sinful as they are deceived. And there is a difference. I believe they suffer from misbelief. That's a word we don't use much. It's a word that means a wrong or a false belief or opinion. And I honestly believe that the devil has disenfranchised many of American Christians who hold misbeliefs about how to relate to politics. So tonight I put together a little message that contains seven common Christian misbeliefs about politics. Some of you may hold these, but I'll guarantee you, even if you don't hold any of these, you've got friends, you've got relatives, you've got coworkers that may be Christians on their way to heaven, but they may hold some of these beliefs, and they are misbeliefs. They are wrong or false opinions or beliefs. They will say or hold that we should just preach the gospel, meaning the church. Church, hey, just preach the gospel. Jesus did not get mixed up in politics. Our real citizenship is in heaven. Hey, our constitution demands separation of church and state. Jesus' kingdom has nothing to do with this world. We must not impose our morality upon other people. And finally, it's never right to resist authority. These are misbeliefs. I want to go through them one by one. I know some of you are already going, seven, seven points? I had ten. I got into this OD, and I said, I got to scrap some of these. Okay. Those who say or hold or believe we should just preach the gospel. And these people, and there are a lot of them, are those who believe the business of the church is to simply get people saved. Elizabeth and I were first baptized into a church like this in 1971. The focus every week was a good one. It was on winning the lost, but it had no vision for the nation. Gabriel Wrench says the church has long bifurcated the gospel and acted like it only applied in your heart and not to the whole world. Beloved, the church needs to capture a kingdom worldview. We need to remember the words of the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20. 26 and 27, therefore I testify you to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Now that word, it could, it's some translations say the whole purpose of God. In other words, Paul said, I didn't limit the preaching of the gospel just to salvation. I preach to you the whole counsel of God, the whole purpose of God. Of God, some translations say. Now, what is the purpose of God? If you come here, I've told you before, I'm pretty sure we can prove that Jesus spoke of the kingdom as the purpose of God. The kingdom of God 
He spoke about it over a hundred times in Scripture. And I've told you the kingdom, when he says kingdom, how many of you know kingdom is a political term? Hello? Is not a kingdom a kind of government? Matthew 24, 14, and several other places, Jesus spoke of the gospel of the kingdom. He says, he who endures to the end shall be saved, in verse 24, in this gospel of the kingdom. Watch this. Will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So he's preaching about advancing his kingdom, that this gospel of the kingdom, which is a political term, it's spiritual, but it's still a political term, should be preached to all the nations, meaning all the political systems, entities, countries, in the world before the end's going to come. In the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 19, verse 16, when Jesus is revealed, it says, we'll have on his robe and his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Big K King of Little K Kings. Are not kings political figures? Capital L Lord of little L Lords are not Lords, political powers and authorities. And some say, well, that, but that's when he comes. He'll be King of King and Lords of Lords. No, he's that right now. I mean, you know, he's not waiting to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He'll be fully revealed as that, but he's that now. They may not know it. They may not accept it, but he is. Don't limit this to the future. And eventually he'll be revealed as Lord of all political systems. Revelation 11, verse 15. And then the uh, the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. I found a, a, a really smart guy, Dr. Peter Enns. He's a theologian. He says at least part of what it means for Jesus to fulfill his prophetic role is his ultimate rule over all rulers and all political regimes. A point made at great length in the book of Revelation. The gospel, in other words, is the standard by which rulers will be judged not so much on the level of personal piety, but on the level of how their rule and actions affect people. Think about it. That's to those who say the church's business is just stick to getting people saved, just preach the gospel. Second misbelief, and I've heard this from people, maybe you have. Hey, Jesus didn't get mixed up In politics, anybody ever heard that? Let me see a hand if you've heard some people say that. Sure. Well, let me say this to them and you. There are many things Jesus didn't get mixed up in. Jesus never married. Didn't get mixed up in marriage. Didn't have children. Never owned a home. Never had his own means of transportation. I mean, have you ever married, had children, or had your own car? Well, Jesus didn't do any of that. In other words, if, if, if you say we shouldn't do anything Jesus didn't do, then there are many things you might have to undo. Just because Jesus didn't directly get involved a lot in politics does not mean it's wrong. He didn't get married. Is it wrong to get married? Didn't have children. Is it wrong to have children? Didn't own a home. Is it wrong to own a home? Do you see the logic falls apart? Three people see that. Okay, look, never forget that whenever Jesus confronted the scribes and the Pharisees, he was confronting the political forces that were in charge in Israel. See, they did not have any uh, sections of government. The, 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 uh, Israel was ruled basically by their religious leaders. The religious leaders and the political leaders were the same. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all those 
They were, they were really political figures. I mean, their judges were called the Sanhedrin. We often forget that the Bible is full of politics. Moses and Aaron, when they went to deliver Israel from Egypt, had to confront Pharaoh, who was the political head of the nation of Egypt, right? Sure he did. In the book of Judges, which, which is a very interesting book, there's 12 or 13 different men, not the one woman, who were called judges, and they were the political rulers of Israel at different times by God's direction. First and second Kings and first and second Chronicles are filled with politics. And many of the prophets confronted kings. Many of God's preachers did not say, well, we don't need to get mixed up in politics. Oh, no. Elijah confronted King Ahab and Queen Jezebel about their sins. Samuel confronted King David about his sin. Nathan confronted King David about, uh, or excuse me, Samuel confronted King Saul about his sin. Nathan confronted King David about his sin. Isaiah confronted King Manasseh. And John the Baptist in the New Testament confronted King Herod. I don't see Christian people or God's men here who say, well, we can't get mixed up in politics. No, quite the contrary. They were commissioned to speak. We have forgotten that holding political governments to God's standards is the job of the church. Dr. N said Christians in, in his is writing Christians in politics. It's about holding powers to a higher standard. It says, one of the things that I find fascinating about the Old Testament is how the power of the king was kept in check. A king's word was not automatically law. A king's will was not automatically the will of God. Rather, a king was held to a higher standard than himself. He said, concerning the prophets, they weren't predictors of a far distant future time but they were conduits for the will of God for very present problems, often focused on the abuse of power by kings or priests. So think of the prophets as part of this check on power. Those who follow Jesus have an obligation to voice their opposition to corrupt rule and to never allow the kingdom of God to become enmeshed with political agendas. Rather, we, like the prophets of old, have the obligation to be sure that justice, peace, and righteousness remain the higher standard by which the state is held accountable rather than aiding and abetting the state to redefine and co-opt that standard. It is our job. It is the job of the church to preach and speak righteousness to the nation, to our schools, to our families, uh, to our friends, to our co-workers, and to political powers. It's part of our responsibility. Third misbelief. I've heard this one. Hey, our Christian citizenship is really in heaven. In other words, earthly citizenship is not what counts. Well, it is true that the apostle Paul spoke of those who were setting their mind on earthly things in Philippians 3.20. He was correcting some. He said, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word there in the, in the verse, citizenship, is from the Greek word polituba, which is the word we get politics from. So he's basically saying our politics, our citizenship is in heaven. So some people take that and turn it into a misbelief that Christians are not supposed to get involved because our, our citizenship, our real citizenship is in heaven. That's true. But this does not preclude our participation in earthly citizenship or politics. Just because we are citizens of heaven does not mean we are not American citizens. Hello? It's like, well, I'm a citizen of heaven, so now I'm not a citizen of America? Now watch. We have multiple citizenships, and I will use Paul as an example. Paul he called himself a citizen of Israel. 
in Philippians 3, Romans 11. And the fact that he was a citizen of heaven and of Israel did not stop him from claiming his Roman citizenship in Acts 16 and 22, nor from appealing to Caesar in Acts 25 when he was under Roman jurisdiction. So people that say, well, our citizenship is in heaven are not being biblical. Yes, our primary citizenship, thank God, how many of you know we're citizens of heaven right now? We haven't gotten there yet, but we're, we're already citizens, but we're still Americans. Some people hold a dual citizenship, plus being Christians. So to use that as an excuse to avoid our civil duties is a cop-out. Fourth misbelief. Our Constitution demands the separation of church and state, and I'm so glad I'm doing this. Because this is the one our enemies use against us so much. When you speak up on policy, anybody ever had anybody correct you and say, hey, wait a minute. We believe in separation of church and state. Sad thing is many Christians use that same thing. In their own minds, they actually believe that there is this legislated separation of church and state that is required by our Constitution. But get this straight. This is going to help somebody. There is no place in the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights or in the amendments that even mentions the phrase separation of church and state. It is not there. You say, well, where did it come from? It comes from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to a group of Baptist pastors in Connecticut to assure them that the new government would never establish a national religion. Because the Christian pastors were concerned. They said, well, this new government, uh, one day they may do what England did and what other nations have done. They would nationalize religion like King uh, Henry did. And you would have to be a particular religion if you were going to be a citizen. And Jefferson wrote, he said, there won't, that won't happen. There will be a wall between church and state or separation. That's where that comes from. Here is what the First Amendment of the Constitution really says. And this is what they misquote or misapply or paraphrase. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to freely assemble and to petition the government for the redress of grievances. That's what it really says. It's an amazing to me how an uninformed church has allowed God's enemies to silence us by misapplying the very law that gives us the freedom to speak out on political issues. If that's not demonic, I don't know what is. I mean, the very thing our fathers gave to the church and to Christians, the power to speak out and engage in politics freely and to assemble together. Well, what do we have today? We have the government right and left overreaching and saying, well, you can't say that. You can't uh -uh, take that off. Put that down. Take that off Facebook. Uh, you can't put that out there. You can't put that out on the radio. Oh, by the way, you can't go to church. You can't assemble uh, because there's a virus out there. They have no right to do that, beloved. They are, they are using ignorance of the church or lack of... I won't say what I was going to say. By the way, the First Amendment... Prohibit that if you can see it prohibits the shutting down of services. And it, it, it just limits us unless you are using the Bible in, in a way that is pleasing to certain politicians. Gary said, why is it the Reverend Jesse Jackson can quote the Bible in support of his pet causes, but conservative ministers and lay people must argue purely on secular grounds? for their social and political agenda. It seems that mixing religion and politics is acceptable as long as the road turns to the left. Hello? That's, that's powerful. 
The socialist politicians in the Washington to even now are twisting the Bible to support their own views and tell the Christians that they can't participate in religion. Politics and religion don't mix. There's a separation of church and state. Where does this come from? This is one of my favorite things the late Jerry Falwell said. He said, the idea that religion and politics don't mix was invented by the devil to keep Christians from running their own country. This is our country. There are more of us than there are of them. By far, if we were united and if we had decent teaching and preaching and instruction, and if God's people were informed, uh, you know, the, the, the 90 million of us are enough to elect righteous presidents, vice presidents, congressmen, senators, and put Bible-honoring judges on the courts. Well, what's going on? The devil has managed to silence... 50 million of us with this kind of stuff, misbelief. Now, I could call it sin, but I'm being charitable in this message. I'm sweetening up. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to accuse my brothers and sisters that they're sinning, but they're, they're definitely misbelieving. We've, laid, we've failed as teachers and preachers to lay the foundation of a biblical worldview into the lives of those we lead. If we had, God's people would realize you can't separate a politician's spiritual views from the politician's policies. Vadi Bokum says, the Bible does speak to every issue of life and our political issues are informed by our theology. There is no such thing as a politician or a political issue that is not theological. You cannot do politics without theology. So we have to break that dichotomy. What is he saying? Think about it. Do you think that when someone goes to Washington in any office whether it's the president or the Congress, do you think that when they make their decisions and plan their policies, they are not, that those are not informed by whatever their spiritual view is of God, whether they believe in God, what God they believe in, whether they don't believe in God at all, they will, that will always affect what they do and how they vote and the legislation that they propose. You can't separate it. The sinister forces at work to overthrow America, as founded, use this separation of church and state concept to keep God out. Billionaire venture capitalist George Soros gives billions to socialist politics and politicians and causes. He does not want a Christian in the Oval Office. Quote, the separation of church and state is the bedrock of our democracy and is clearly undermined by having a born-again president. This is what we're up against. Socialists see every Christian political leader as a threat to their commitment to keep Christians out of politics. Christian businessman Gabriel Wrench calls for repentance. For too long, Christians have been drinking the Kool-Aid of private faith, separation of church and state, and thinking somehow that Jesus is Lord over heaven, but not over earth. Fifth misbelief, Jesus' kingdom has nothing to do with this world. Jesus' kingdom has nothing to do with this world. Now, what they're doing is they're taking something Jesus said in John 18, 36, where he said, my kingdom is not of this world. So they take that and they believe it means that Christians ought not to be involved in anything political. But they fail to consider the context. That statement by Jesus 
is made when he is on trial in front of Pontius Pilate for his life. And, he's, and he accuses him of being a king. And then uh, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. But then he says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus was not saying, I'm a king, but my kingdom has nothing to do with this world. He was saying, I am a king, but my kingdom is not from this world. There is a big difference. He wasn't saying my kingdom has nothing to do with this world. He's saying my kingdom is not from this world. Matthew Henry clarifies. He means his kingdom's rise is not from this world. The kingdoms of men rise out of the earth, but the holy city comes from God out of heaven. His kingdom is not by succession, not by election or conquest, but by the immediate and special designation of the divine will and counsel. Albert Barnes, the great Bible commentator, says Jesus is saying that his kingdom is not of, of this world. That is, it is not the same of the same nature as earthly kingdoms. It was not originated for the same purpose or conducted on the same plan. Then he immediately adds a circumstance in which they differ. The kingdoms of this world are defended by arms. They maintain armies and engage in wars. If the kingdom of Jesus had been of this kind, he says he would have excited the multitudes that followed him to prepare for battle. What he's saying is, Mike, I don't get my power from this world. I wasn't elected in this world. I don't get my authority from this world. I am here by divine direction and decree. I don't depend on, if I was like you or the other nations of the world, I would fight. I would tell my people, rise up, fight. I don't do that because my kingdom works on a different plan. But there's no place in here he says, uh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm a king, but I have nothing to say to you guys. He never said that. It's misusing Jesus' words to discourage Christian involvement in the political arena. Misbelief number six, we must not seek to impose our morality on other people. My personal opinion is this is one of the worst excuses Christians use for not voting. Have you ever heard a friend, a family member, a co-worker who's a Christian say, well, you know what, really, we shouldn't try to impose our morality on other people. I mean, that's just not the way to do it. That's just not right. Well, how many of you know the laws of a nation define the nation as to its character? Laws are an expression of morality. All laws. Now, you might need to think about this. For example, God gave Israel his law at Mount Sinai when he made them a nation. You see, you can't have a nation without laws. That's what makes a nation a nation, not just boundaries, laws. And the laws of a nation tell you what kind of a nation it is what level of morality it has. You can study any nation's laws and you can understand the character or the nature behind that government. The Ten Commandments are the expression of God's nature. That's what they are. They're moral statements. Gary DeMar said, all law is the imposition of someone else's view of morality. All law, all law is the imposition of someone's view of morality. The question is, what areas of life are civil magistrates given the authority to legislate and by what ultimate standard? I guarantee you that non-Christians have no problem, listen, non-Christians have no problem imposing their morality on the rest of us. They do it with every piece of legislation they draft and hope to put into law. Hello, I can't say it any better than that. The people who hate God, hate Christ, the people who want to transform America into a socialist nation, they don't hesitate for one second to impose their beliefs and moral codes on you through laws. 
But Christians sit over in the corner by the millions and don't vote, don't let, don't speak out, don't do anything because we wouldn't want to impose our morals on them. Well, somebody's going to impose something on somebody. It's time we got our head in the game. There was a time when abortion was on demand was illegal in this country. There were laws against it. Laws passed by Christians who were involved in politics. Anti-abortion laws were the expression of a Christian morality. But what happened? In 1973, the Supreme Court legalized the murder of children in the Roe v. Wade decision by a vote of seven to two. It wasn't even close. The court ruled that state laws that banned abortion were unconstitutional. Think of it. Seven men, unelected men in black robes, made a decision that has resulted in the death of over 61 million babies. These men were not elected to office. They were appointed by the, a president. What kind of president would appoint these kind of judges who would then impose their moral code on a nation? Seven men. Our current president has now nominated a Christian woman to sit on the court who could tilt the court toward overturning Roe v. Wade because she's known as, about, as a devout Roman Catholic who actually practices her faith and how they hate her. Why? Because she's a professing Roman Catholic politician who supports banning abortion. You can't get away from the importance of politics. Somebody's going to impose their morality on someone. Wake up. <clears throat> the seventh misbelief, it is never right to resist authority. Now, I, I, I had a slide, but I didn't use it about, someone had this online. I mean, this is out there. It says, uh, quotes Romans 13, which says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities. Why? Verse 2, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Romans 13 is the one chapter in the Bible that specifically addresses the limitations and the jurisdictions that God has ordained for civil government. And it includes the call for Christians to submit to authority. And I will not take back a word of that it's in the Bible, and I believe that's what it means. The operative word in the misbelief is never. Did you hear that? What was the misbelief? Do you remember? It's the misbelief, it is never right to resist authority. See, the scripture says it's, it, the general rule is you do not resist authority. You submit yourself to the governing authorities because God has put them there. But the operative word is when they say never. Roger Williams, who was the founder of, of the Rhode Island colony said this about that text. He said, this scripture must not be wrestled from its place. It cannot mean that the power of the civil magistrate may be exercised in matters of the spirit and soul. In other words, the rule is there and it's true until don't say never because if the government, and we've taught on God and government in here, when you get out of your sphere, see, God has ordained spheres, which we've taught on this, 
There's self-government, there's family government, there's church government, and there's civil government. And God has established them all and set boundaries and spheres. And you are not to cross over out of the boundary that God has assigned to you into the other spheres where you really have no authority. So all of this is true until the governing authority causes you or commands you or requires you to do something that violates a clear command from God, who is the higher authority. That's why in Acts chapter five, when they were dragged before the council and the high priest said, who, you know, didn't we tell you, didn't we command you not to teach in the name of Jesus? But Peter said, and the apostles said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Right there. You see, if, 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 if uh, Peter and the apostles looked at each other and say, well, he, they, he, he said we can't preach in the name of Jesus. And we can't resist. It's never right to resist or disobey the authority. So when, he, when the council says we can't preach Jesus, we're done. They didn't say that. They said we'd rather obey God than men. Can I have an amen? The same thing happened in Acts 4 when they called them, uh, commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And, and uh, uh, Peter and John said, we can't but speak the things that we have seen and heard. There's many, there's many biblical examples of godly resistance to civil authorities. In, in Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh commanded that all the Hebrew children, all the males, two years and under, were to be slain. But the midwives feared God in verse one, chapter 1, verse 17, and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them but they saved the male children alive. And Pharaoh calls them on the carpet. He says, what have you done? Don't you know that I commanded? I gave the law that you've got to kill all these babies, uh, male babies, two years and under. But it says in verse 20 and 21, but God delivered the midwives and blessed them. God was kind to the midwives. And because they feared God, he gave them families of their own. In the book of Daniel, the king commanded the three Hebrew children to bow down and worship his idol, and they said, we will not bow down. In the same book, Daniel well, was commanded that he couldn't pray, defied the king's command, and he ended up in the lion's den, but God delivered him. The lesson is that God approved of civil disobedience where the political power stepped out of their sphere God commands us to obey the civil government to a point where our obedience would either require disobedience to God or violate our Christian conscience. And at that point, he will bless the disobedient. So I'm going to close and let you up. There's, these are seven common misbeliefs about politics. There they are. Now, I went through them kind of fast. I mean, we could have gone more. And like I said, I had two or three more. But suffice it to say that our greatest need today, and I mean this with all my heart, brothers, there's this standing three weeks away from an election where we're being told that over half of us aren't even going to vote. If there's anything we need to do, it's re-enfranchise the millions of born-again voters for the coming election, we have got to get American Christians awoke about what the Bible says about Christians and politics. Thank God William Wilberforce in England, a Christian, was willing to get involved in politics. He was the, the one who led the abolition of slavery in Great Britain by mobilizing Christians and speaking the word of God. He said this to his fellow believers, a private faith that does not act in the face of oppression is no faith at all. I found this quote from Wilberforce's great, great grandson. I'm often asked what 
would the campaigns my great-great-grandfather be fighting today if he were alive? At the top of the list would be the issue of abortion. He says, he says abortion is the slavery issue for today. Awakened American Christians are quite rightly calling us to pray, and God knows we better pray. Prayer is like almost like a no-brainer because nothing I've said much lately is I've not been much on that, but everybody knows we need to pray. Prayer is happening. Thank God. Prayer is happening in the streets. Prayer is happening in neighborhoods. People are praying. Christians are praying. We better pray. But here is a great quote from Wilberforce. There is a time to get on your knees and pray. But there's a time to get up off your knees and do something. I tell you with all seriousness, with all due regard and respect for prayer and the need we have for it, if that's all we do, we're done. That's all we do. Because there's a lot of these people, they're sitting there using these excuses for not one of these seven or they got some more. And they'll say, well, we're not, we're not voting we're not involved. We shouldn't get involved. Whatever reason they use. I mean, they're sitting out there, and uh, but we're praying. But we're praying. Oh, we need to pray. Oh, we need to pray. You know what? Your faith's worth nothing to me. You say, well, prayer will help. But if everybody's like that, hon, who's going to vote? We need to pray that God will deliver us from all misbelief that has immobilized us politically, and then we have to act. And uh, Thomas Jefferson said, the government you elect is the government you deserve. I've said this before, and I'll say it again, and I'll stand by it. I don't know how it's going to go. I really don't. But there is no question in my mind, if this does not go the way of righteousness, in the presidency, in the Senate, in the House of Representatives, in these elections that are being, if it goes the wrong way, I am not going to give credit to the sinners. I'm going to say to my brothers and sisters, where were we? Why didn't we show up? Why didn't we show up? Can I have an amen? I hope this equips you. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm speaking to people that already know, but I'm, sometimes things need to be reinforced. How I many of you got at least one thing tonight that will help you trying to talk to your brothers and sisters? Because this is the, we've got to do our own recruitment. It's like we've got to start talking to our brothers and sisters. I mean, I'm not going out on the street and try to get the sinners to vote. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the Christian people will look to their brothers and sisters and say, are you going to vote? Are you going to vote? No, I'm not. And if they give you one of these, well, I just gave you some answers. Amen. God help us. Oh God, we just, oh, we do pray. God help America. Oh my God, I ask you to awaken your church, Lord. I ask you to awaken your people, Lord, before it's too late, Lord, to awaken us to the crisis of the moment and I ask you to shine the light on the lies of the devil and every, uh, every scheme and every, every device that the enemy has devised to disenfranchise the people of God, that, that, that every, everything he has done uh, that would that immobilize us, uh, take our voice away, Lord, uh, cause us to forget our responsibility as citizens of a nation so great because you birthed it. I ask you, God, to help us. Help us all, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.